I think what we're going to talk about tonight, I mean, you know, to talk about Cuba is really vast. Uh, I mean, it's so vast, and I don't really know how much all of you are immersed in the whole thing. And, um, um, you know, I, I think what I, what's interesting right now is to talk about literally what's going on right now, post Ilian Cuba, and what's going on with the United States, because there's a lot of a lot of uh, confusing signals right now. It looks like we're going forward, it looks like we're going backward. And I thought, I was thinking about how can I sort of bring us all up to speed so we're all sort of on the same playing um, field to begin. And there's something, I've never done this, but I think it really sets the situation. I'm gonna read you a little bit from some, some excerpts from something I wrote recently well, during the whole Lillian Gonzalez thing in the Washington Post, an, an essay I wrote. I just want to um, sort of level the playing field here. So, and then we can, and then I'll talk some more about what's going on right now and some pending legislation. And then you can then ask me questions and we can find out what you're interested in, okay? I don't know, by the way, how long do we, uh, just so I know the time, do we have to be out of here? Is that, Oh my God, please. Oh my God, a fate worse than death. All right, all right, this was, all right, this is, a, um, let me just begin and read you something. Um, and, I'll, and I'm gonna interrupt my own reading, but <laughs> with my own thoughts. <laughs> all right, but I can do it because I wrote it. Some time ago, a Cuban father learned that his estranged wife had taken off for the United States along with their five-year-old son Enraged at the prospect of his child being raised in the land of Yankee imperialism by relatives who supported his political enemies, the father wrote to his sister, quote, I refuse even to think that my son may sleep a single night under the same roof sheltering my most repulsive enemies and receive on his innocent cheeks the kisses of those miserable Judases, unquote. The father later tricked the boy's mother into letting the child visit him in Mexico, then refused to return him. She hired kidnappers and got the boy back, eventually taking him to the United States. After a protracted battle, however, the father prevailed and the child ended up in Havana. However, I think some of you may think that this is about the case of Ellie and Gonzalez. It's not about Elian Gonzalez. This is the story, this is a 45-year-old case. This is the story, the divorced Cuban father was Fidel Castro, the abducted child was his firstborn son, Fidelito. Um, in 1954, Castro's own family mirrored the schism that would eventually divide much of Cuban society. And I'm reading this to you because this is really the fundamental core issue of why we are in a 42-year Cold War with a little Caribbean country whose principal crop is, uh, is sugarcane. Um, at 28, Castro, a rebel leader, seeking to overthrow the dictator uh, Fulgencio Batista was in prison for a failed attack on the Moncada military garrison a year earlier. His wife of six years, Mirta diaz Ballard, from a powerful family with connections to the Batista regime. That summer, Mirta diaz Ballard con contacted Fidel Castro in prison and announced that she wanted a divorce from him and left for the United States, taking their little son, Fidelito, who was then the age of Ilian Gonzalez, five, six years old. Um, eventually, all the diaz Balarts would emigrate to Miami, and Lincoln diaz Balart, who some of you may be aware is the congressman representing Miami uh, in the United, the Republican congressman, um, he is now Fidel Castro's number one nemesis politically in this country. Uh, okay, but backtracking a bit. From his jail cell, the indomitable Castro instructed his lawyers to fight for the custody of his son. Now, I want you to know this is a Batista prison. We're talking 1956. At any time, he could disappear. And he, uh, 
he's been sentenced basically to life in prison, and he's sitting in a prison cell in solitary confinement telling his lawyer, Get my, I'm not, I want custody of my kid. From, who's, from his ex-wife is a member of the most powerful family, and her father is the head of the interior ministry. This is, I just want you to look at the, the quality of the character of this man who's running this country today. Um, and this is what he did. He wrote in the same letter to his sister, Lydia. Um, he, this is him describing his in-laws as Judas is. To take this child away from me, they would have to kill me. I lose my head when I think about these things." Unquote. And should the courts in Cuba rule against me, he vowed, I will fight until death. He lost the first battle. By year's end, Mirta diaz Velarde had gotten her divorce and she retained custody. She, he wrote to his sister again, fuming, one day I'll be out of here. I'll get my son back and my honor back even if the earth should be destroyed in the process. If they think they can wear me down and that I'll give up the fight, they're going to find out that I am prepared to reenact the famous Hundred Years' War and I'll win it. This is a guy in a prison cell. Um, he got out in 55, this, it made Batista's biggest mistake. Um, <laughs> how <laughs> Batista, he gave political prisoners an amnesty, um, and uh, he got out, and he went to Mexico, plotted his return, did the granma with his, you know, his straggly followers, and they came back, and they he went into Santiago and eventually um, prevailed. But while he's in Mexico, he writes his ex-wife again, who he's already threatened to take to the wall, and he convinces her to give him Fidelito. Well, guess what? He doesn't re return the kid. He, doesn't re he keeps his son there. Uh, two weeks were over, and the boy was not sent back to his mother. Instead, Castro installed him in the walled Mexico City mansion of a wealthy couple. In a November 24th letter uh, to the couple, he defended his trickery, saying that he acted not through any resentment of any kind, but only thinking of my son's future. Um, well, what, what happened here is a, a week later, a distraught Mirta diaz Balart, she flew to Mexico City where her politically connected family, with the help of the Cuban embassy, retained three professionals <laughs> who uh, followed his sisters, Emma and Lydia, as they strolled through Chapultepec Park with Fidelito, and basically they kidnapped him back, as only her family could do. Uh, diaz Balart who had remarried the son of a Cuban diplomat, then took Fidelito to New York, where he attended school in, New York, in Queens. Um, and then, um, but then her victory was very short-lived. In January of 1959, he seized control of his country. He again talked her into just letting Fidelito come back and just you know, be there for this reception. Well, that was the last time she got custody of, of uh, Fidelito, and basically he retained custody of his kid, and, and Fidelito still lives in Havana. Now, I take the time to read you from the, this story and these letters, because if you don't understand the character of Fidel Castro, you just can't see, you can't, you can't get a handle on why we're in this morass. Um, one of the things, and, and the, uh, there, it's a, ver a very helpful prism for looking at Cuba. Instead of saying, they're right, they're wrong, it's Miami exiles, no, it's the Cuba, is if you look at it through the prism of the family feud, like the biggest family feud imaginable, and beginning with the Castro family, beginning with the Castro Diaz Balart family. Because at the end of the day, what we have here is 42 years in power in Cuba, and the person who continuously sponsors all the embargo amendments and everything else is his former nephew, his former nephew and the blood uncle of his son Fidelito, Lincoln Diaz Balart. Um, this, and it's very interesting to me how this is rarely mentioned that everybody is related here. And 
you know, and a lot of people talked about how could everybody be acting the way they did during the Yelling Gonzales. There's also, you know, there's another thing I find very helpful, and that's the idea of what I call La Misma Cosa, the same thing. If you can look at Havana and Miami almost as like parallel universes, a mirror universe, I could show you almost identical behaviors historically on each side over and over and over again. During the Ilian Gonzalez thing, one of the things I found most amusing is how everybody was accusing everybody of the same thing. Um, uh, the, uh, the Cubans in uh, Cuba were saying, my God, you know, they've kidnapped him, uh, they drugged him, he's on drugs, uh, and, um, and they're holding him against us. When they, then, then, then Miami Cubans were saying, when they got him back, did you see he's on drugs? They kidnapped him back and he's on drugs. I mean, they literally said the identical, the, just identical. And everybody had the same thing, kidnapping, druggings, interrogations being held against their will. It was just amazing. Whoever had him said, said this. Now, I'm not trying to equate both sides because I think there was definitely um, a moral rightness to the father's case, and I'm very personally um, I'm pleased that he did prevail. And I don't I think no matter what, that um, you know one's um, you know how on earth um, how on earth they could have convinced themselves that they could take this man's kid and keep him in Miami. Well, you know you you sort of have to know the whole Miami situation to really. To, this, this is something that the shattered family is something that almost affects, you know, I would say 75% of Cuban families. You will find, um, and most Cuban families, are relatives here and relatives there. Um, I'll tell you um, the story, actually, some of you may have seen Lilia Medina at the Santa Barbara Museum. One of the things that I find very interesting is her own family story. Um, Lilia's, um, Lilia's um, family, she was, she was born in, uh, they were, she lived in Havana. Her mother was a follower of Prio, the president that this will predates Castro and even Batista. Um, her father was a very big Batistiano, supported the Batista. Her aunt was a major Fidelista. Um, when the revolution struck, her father, of course, was, went to bat for Batista. Her aunt went into the hills in the Sierra Maestra, and uh, her husband was one of the big gorillas up there, and she became a, a gorilla. One of the last conversations she had with her, her brother, the Batistiana, was, if we capture you, words to this effect, we capture you, I hope I'm the one who sends you to the wall and does the execution. This is one family. He, he, uh, he left uh, Cuba. Actually, he was the pilot who flew Batista out the night of his escape, January 1st, 1959. I think, I think it was Felipe Medina. Uh, he actually you know, took Batista, and then, of course, the National Treasury went with him. And uh, there were three planes, mm -hmm. and they left that night. His mm -hmm. sister. Um, stayed behind and became the head of the CDR, which is basically translates to the Committee of, to de, for the Defense of the Revolution, of Guanabacoa. Guanabacoa is outside of Havana. It's about as fidelista as you can get. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely the red hot center of that, that whole world. Um, they did not talk for 35 years, this brother and sister, who had once been extremely close. Um, complete silence. My friend decides, well, you know, she'd like to see her homeland. She hasn't been there since she's eight years old. She'll go. Of course, her parents go apoplectic, you know. I mean, apoplectic about the, the traitor and the this and the that and all that. But she decides she's, she's going to go. And she goes down there. And, and she eventually visits her aunt. And as she's leaving her aunt's house, I mean, he, she's, the last words were something, and by the way, how is my brother? <laughs> and that was the first contact. And from that moment on, um, through, through that visit, through that uh, began a process of reconciliation. And this brother 
and sister who had not a word for 35 years, um, some letters were exchanged and some reconciliation was achieved before he died. And, um, but that's where we're at right now. Most of Cuba, we're, we're just in this intractable Cold War mentality. Now, much of it has to do with the biggest foreign policy folly, I think, you know, well, there's, there's many. You're absolutely, there's, there's many. But it's one of them. Um, it's a colossal folly uh, out of Washington for very short-term benefits. Um, and, um, you know, the obvious way to resolve this is through contact. And everything has been done to strangle the situation. Basically, the position of Lincoln D. Espelard, Fidel Castro's um, former nephew, is we will strangle this country into submission. And if he had his druthers, he has said he wants a, link, uh, a naval blockade around Cuba. Now, can you imagine putting a naval blockade around a Caribbean island? Um, you, know, you know, naval blockades are traditionally used for countries about to invade you. And um, so this is really, and what this is about is uh, the only thing that will satisfy this faction is a complete Pyrrhic you know, uh, revenge, victory. Um, and one of the saddest things to me about the whole Cuban situation is, um, is that how this kind of far right wing faction has completely dominated the exile community. I mean, I know literally hundreds and hundreds of exiles living in this country. Um, if those who do not agree with the formal policy coming out of the leadership in Miami, they don't talk. There is nervous talking. I can never get them on record any more than I can get somebody on record in Pinar del Rio to tell me about um, you know, their complaints with the government. They don't go on record. They don't use their names. I remember once interviewing Bernardo Benes, who does go on record so I can say his name. He was a very powerful businessman in Miami. He led a thing called the Dialogo. Dialogo means dialogue. Well, di Dialogo is a dirty word in Miami. It means you're a triador. It means you're a comunista, you know? And all these people who went on this Dialogo, uh, they came home and, you know, you know, they were pariahs. He ended up wearing um, a bulletproof vest, he said, for years. I remember the first time when I first got into these areas, he said to me, he says, you do not understand what's going on here. He says, this is Guatemala. He says, that's how much fear there is here. This is Miami. This is Miami, he told me this in 93, 94. Now, I'm not, I think there's some exaggeration, because there's not death squads going out, you know, shooting people down. But the level of fear that you can lose your job, you will lose your, you know, you know, well, first of all, there was, uh, there have been murders, and there have been attempted murders, and um, a great deal of terrorism. Um, at one time, I think Joan Didion wrote that in 1980, the FBI had Miami as the center of terrorism. So there is some, there was some threat, and certainly there's been plenty of Molotov cocktails thrown at people, and you know, a lot of harassment, but. Um, Certainly, it's just not going to improve your job prospects if you become a vocal supporter of negotiations with Cuba and you're living in Miami. So, you know, the whole thing has just taken on some extremely tragic dimensions. And I think what happened here during Eli and Gonzalez, that the insaneness and the irrationality that those of us who cover Cuba um, for years and everybody who knows this issue, Know, knew about this faction in the exile community, that the rest of the world got to see this. The rest of the world got to see just how crazy this whole situation was. Um, and I think to some extent that that was beneficial. <laughs> um, because I think a lot of people just did not understand what was, what was the actual bulwark for our policy. And basically what goes on is every four years we elect a president and they all get pretty desperate about winning just like our two people tonight. And they get very nervous about uh, votes and they start figuring things down to like literally 300,000 votes here, 300,000 votes here. And 
someone's figured out the demographics that, although we're talking about such a small uh, percentage, I mean, the, the American, uh, the polls during Ilian were up to 75% of the American public. Of course, one wanted to return the boy to his father, but two wanted to end the embargo. So you say to yourself, how does 75% of the American public lose out to 300,000 exiles in Miami? Because they figure these things down, down to, you know, they're counting heads. And they're trying to figure out how they're going to carry Miami and carry the Electoral College. And then they figure they're going to get another 300,000 votes up in Union City, New Jersey, another key state. So between these two communities, where they're, they're, they're thinking that somebody could possibly spin and maybe max a million votes, 75% of the American public who wants to just have something new, different, change, out the window. And they will both outdo themselves. Um, there's lots of things I could tell it to you about. A lot of people think that Bill Clinton's loosened this up. In fact, under Bill Clinton, in the last eight years, we have gone completely retrograde on Cuba. We are back to an Eisenhower um, Cold War mode. I mean, under Bill Clinton, as a result of Bill Clinton, we got the Torricelli bill. By the way, is this thing, is this just me? Does it seem to, does this sound okay? It sounds louder to me. Oh, okay. Um, we got the Torricelli bill. You may recall that when Bill Clinton was running for office the first time, our boy Bill, um, which was, what, what is that, in 92, right? Well, he, of course, was fighting for Miami. Now, Miami exiles, traditionally the majority always supported the Republicans. And this has been one of the things that's made them kind of, well, well, they've always been sort of Richard Nixon type uh, supporters. Now basically, that faction, if you're trying to get that vote, forget it. Because they will never forget, forgive John F. Kennedy. To this day, they, you bring up Kennedy at certain coffee shops in Miami, you will just get two hours about how he destroyed and killed our people and everything. You know, the Kennedy stuff is like it happened yesterday. Um, so that group, nothing was going to get them past John F. Kennedy not supporting them at Bay of Pigs. Nothing. But this goes on and on and on and on that the de Democrats are going to prevail. So in 92, uh, Bill Clinton got desperate, as he's wont to do. And he also was kind of out of money. Um, and at that time, a guy named Torricelli, you know, in our Senate, now a senator, then a representative, House of Representatives, Torricelli was pushing a bill to tighten the embargo called the Torricelli bill, or I think he dressed it up as the free, the, some democracy. They would call it democracy. Every time they're tightening Cuba, it's democracy. Anyway, he had just become best friends with Jorge Mascanosa, who was the scourge of Fidel Castro, who wanted to basically take Fidel's job in Cuba, and ran Miami with an iron fist. A controversial, scandal play guy, but ran Miami like the, be the, the Caudillo cacique he was. Um, and um, any event, lo and behold, what do you think happens is uh, Bill Clinton has a meeting with um, Jorge Mascanosa in um, Miami. I think Jorge got him around $325,000. And the next thing you know is um, uh, Bill, Bill Clinton was out there saying, we've got to support the Torricelli bill, which of course George Bush, the president, said never in a thousand years would he sign that because, um, because of the extraterritorial element. So he cornered George Bush into signing that. That's 92. Then we get the Helms-Burton bill. And I guess Sandy Berger, his national security, I don't know how he did Helms Burgo Burton, but basically what Helms Burton did in 96, it, it put the embargo in, from the president's office into Congress, act of Congress. Can you imagine that rabble having control over something like Cuba? I mean, really, I mean, it makes you think about what Mark Twain's um, thinking on this whole thing. So in other words, before, 96 and Helms Burton, any president in the United States could simply just end the embargo with, his pen, with a signature. Over. Now you need the U.S. Congress and all these pandering politicians 
who are susceptible to anybody who put, you know, bring some money near them, they now have control over this. So who do you think has all the money? Um, and now, um, some of you may be thinking that things are loosening up because of a farm bill. And there is a very, very interesting coalition going on now. We have the Chamber of Commerce, the businessmen, we have the farmers, all hooked up with the old lefties, all saying let's end the embargo, of course for different reasons. You know, the Chamber of Commerce is very nervous about all the foreign investment going in, and the farmers want, you know, want it, are looking for new markets. Um, but part of that farm bill, who do you think popped up out of the farm bill? Lincoln Diaz Ballard. And Lincoln Diaz Ballard says, you want that farm bill? And he tagged an amendment on it. And the amendment, if Clinton will sign it, he probably will, because he's a complete wuss, is the amendment freezes travel. Again, now takes travel from the executive office and the president's office, because it gives it to Congress. Um, so if he signs this bill, it means that, I mean, and why in God's name for the last month he hasn't just, you know, released travel and just opened it up to everybody? Right now you can go to Cuba if you're with a cultural group, which if you have a half brain about you is not so complicated. You know, you just say I'm going down there for culture, or you say I'm a reporter, or you say I'm whatever. I'm a thinker, I think. I think they can't keep you out. <laughs> and, um, you know, but however, the average guy in the street does not do that kind of, you know, clever... But the point being is that once again, you're giving to Congress, you know, professional panderers, the right to control foreign policy. So um, I, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, because I never know if I'm like confusing, you know, giving too much, putting too much on your plate, um, or if it's, uh, you know, not clear enough to you. Um, so I thought what I'd do is let you ask me some questions, and if there's something I didn't, wasn't clear about, if you wanted to illuminate it, we'll go from there. And if not, I'll just continue on. <laughs> Somebody have a question or anything, or anything interests you? Yeah. Um, our guides that were missing tonight, uh, have, have, I don't remember a single thing that either one of them has said about Cuba uh, in the debates. That's or right. even uh, uh, in smaller venues right. when they've been speaking. Have right. they, has, has either Bush or Gore said anything about Cuba? Too Cuba much. Cuba policy? Yes, too much. Um, they try to avoid a big debate. It's very interesting. Um, of course, George Bush is going to do the, tip, the, the traditional Republican line, which is that tyrant, that tyrant. Um, now, Gore's numbers, I would say that the most serious setback to Gore happened during the Alien Gonzalez thing. And um, because if you may recall, he just outpandered himself. He just, you know, they kept saying during Alien Gonzalez that they wanted to, they kept saying, this is an issue for the family courts of Miami. Now, of course, the conventional wisdom being family court in Miami, everybody knows fam judges are elected there. What judge is going to be elected there who wouldn't immediately give custody to, you know, uh, the D.S. Ballard crowd um, or be driven out of town on a rail? I mean, it, so they kept saying that. But lo and behold, an amazing thing happened. An absolutely amazing thing that got absolutely no, very little, um, very, very little attention. And that's that a judge down there, a non-Cuban judge, I think one of the few, <laughs> Um, actually issued a ruling saying that Lacero Gonzalez, the boy's great uncle, as you may recall, who claimed that he, that kid belonged to him, said he had no standing in the courts, that Flo Florida law did not recognize uh, a great uncle, and that he couldn't have the kid. And it all just said the case was without any merit. This ruling got like zero attention. And months and months afterwards, both candidates would say, this belongs in family court. Well, family court, miracle of miracles, said the case has no merit. Florida court says a great uncle cannot take custody of a child. And I, it, it, it amazes me at press conferences that people don't stand up and say, Vice President, Governor Bush, they threw it out. You know, now what are you going to do? How low are we going to get here? But it's amazing. No one ever holds their feet to their fire on this thing. But basically, their position is 
pan, you know. Well, it's very interesting because you might even see more opening under Bush, oddly enough, because he's such a free trader. You know, the Bushes are nothing but free traders. And his whole thing is he wants, you know, NAFTA, NAFTA eyes the continent. He wants North and South America to be a big NAFTA. Well, South America is not going to go NAFTA. There's not going to be free trade accords and knock out Cuba. They will not do this. Um, they're all deeply, deeply involved with Cuba. So in some ways, now on the other hand, you could say, well, Jeb is at Miami. But you want to know something? If you look back at Ilian Gonzalez, probably the politician who conducted himself the best was Jeb Bush. You know why? He said nothing. He knew the whole thing was trouble. And, and he's been burned by, you know, Cuban Americans himself. I mean, he was in business with a guy named Ricare, who is now a fugitive. I mean, um, so he, he's well aware, um, you know, how, how the, it can all bite you. I mean, in Cuban American politics are, are known around Washington as the third rail. The, for those of you for, not from New York, the third rail is the part of the subway rail. You touch it, you're, you're dead. So. Um, Anyway, so that, that's basically that situation. On the other hand, you know that nice guy, that very seemingly nice, urbane, you know, civilized man, Joseph, Joe Lieberman? And up to here with Jorge Mascanosa, best friend, probably got his seat because of Jorge Mascanosa. Nobody was more instrumental of putting Joe Lieberman in office. Jorge Mascanosa had, uh, who ran the Cuban American National Foundation and made it the most powerful lobby in the country, maybe next to the Israeli lobby. He, his, one of his big nemesis was Lowell Weicker. Remember Lowell Weicker from Connecticut? Well, Lowell Weicker said, what's with this 35-year uh, policy? This is a complete failure. This isn't about whether Castro is nice or not nice or a tyrant. This is a total failure. We are, how are we losing to a Caribbean country? I mean. This is a failure. Let's change it. That was the end of Lowell Weicker. They got Lieberman. And who do you think financed Lieberman? Jorge Mascanosa. Most, the big money came from there. And they campaigned for him. You look at Lieberman's voting record on Cuba. It is identical to Lincoln Diaz Balart, you know, the aggrieved nephew. Um, and why has the Cuban American National Foundation not endorsed anybody today? Because they always go Republican, right? It's the, well, now that they're, oh, they're now, they used to be a nonprofit, and then this year they became a lobby, as if we didn't know they were a lobby. Uh, you know, they was like, <laughs> it was like one of these great, you're kidding. You really think we don't think you're a lobby? They're now an official lobby. And um, because, as they said, Joe Lieberman, the new head of the foundation says, Joe Lieberman is our best friend. So, I mean, Joe Lieberman served on the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, that Jorge Mascanosa put together. This, was a, this is the ultimate act of hubris. I mean, the true sign of a natural caldeo is he put together a commission that, about how he would run Cuba, what, what it's going to be like when he's in charge. Well, he never did quite come out and say it, but we all knew uh, what it was going to be like. And it was, you know, who's going to do business, who gets the contracts, who gets, who's going to, how they were going to divvy up, you know, the whole country, right back to the old banana republicood. And uh, he, blew, Joe, Joe Lieberman was on that commission. Um, and that was that. I don't know. I don't really know the exact date. I think it's around ten years ago. So, if you ask me now, on the other hand. Gore's lowest numbers went in Ilian. I mean, he is, and I hear in his campaign, they're still staggered about that. Because, of course, Joe Lieberman, Lieberman wanted to go down Calle Ocho in Miami and, you know, go around and, you know, kiss little, you know, Cuban babies. And they told him, don't even go near this. It's the third rail. And they basically have him on a, you know, they're keeping this. But who knows? In the last weeks of the campaign, anything is possible. Because remember, it comes down to less than a million votes. If they can snag those. But I think at this point, the Democrats really know it, it's, you know, it's people who are still in a rage at John F. Kennedy are not going to be voting for them. But rationality has never been a, a factor in this debate. How about another question? Yeah. 
the most common question I always hear is, you know, what about Fidel Castro? What's going to happen after he's gone? I know you have a, you're in contact with him. Can you give us some insight into what he's thinking after this is all over? Well, I can't say I've been, you know, I haven't had a conversation with him about this since 94. Um, but uh, I did see him a couple months ago down there, you know, during the 26th of July, which is basically their 4th of July, celebrating what I just read to you, the, the attack on Moncada. Basically what uh, I see is happening is Fidel Castro is in power as long as he wants. The man dies in bed with his boots on. You know, that's, that's, that's the deal. Um, it's just sort of like the left version of Franco, who also died in bed. Not, not, not only that, they said he was alive even after he was dead. They were in <laughs> such a, and I think a similar thing will happen. They'll have the body there and they'll go, oh my, you know, all right. And, and of course, Raul will step right up. And Raul Castro, his, younger, his youngest brother, the youngest of all the Castros, it's a large family, uh, by the way, there is a sister in Miami, who Juanita, uh, who also, you know, frequently condemns her brother. And as you know, he has an illegitimate daughter, Alina, who's now in Spain. And Alina, there's nothing Alina won't say about her father, except she won't accept that about how much he ignored her, um, and said he wasn't her father. But I think he was, because they both drink a huge amount. And uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, um, so, uh, I, yeah, I think that's basically what's going to happen. Raul will step in. Is there any faction you don't hear about? Some young communist group while you're there? Yeah. Well, there was one called uh, Roberto Robaina, who used to be the head of Ujota, say, the Young Communist League down there. Well, he started to get some independent mm -hmm. uh, thinking, and on my last trip I found out he's in a rehabilitation camp, and that's not a detox place. That's um, that's, you know, for officers who have gone astray, that I heard that, um, well, he may be somewhat implicated in some prostitution scandal, but, you know, that would not be enough to make him lose the foreign ministry. And uh, he was the foreign minister, and the new foreign minister is uh, Felipe um, uh, Perez Roque. And Felipe used to... He was at the university, not very, never a rocket scientist, but he was the, the, you know, he gave a lot of big party speeches, and the next thing you know, he got recruited to be Fidel's secretary, and he was Fidel's secretary for the last 10 years. I mean, so really, right, and it's just, uh, one of the stories I love is that when his wife gave birth to their first child, this is how devoted Felipe is to Fidel Castro. His first child's born. He stays at the. He doesn't go to the hospital. He stays with Fidel Castro. He does not get to the hospital until like ten hours after the baby's born because he's. All right, and that's you know that's pretty much what it takes to stay in power. There is you gotta you know have your priorities sort sorted out. Um, you know, and then if Fidel Castro can be very very benevolent. If you get your priorities sorted out, they have a wonderful saying in Cuba, inside the revolution, anything, outside the revolution, nothing. <laughs> and, and that's it, you know. You don't mess around with the government, they don't really mess around with you. I mean, they don't come after you. It's not like a sinister thing like we had in Chile, you know, where they're gonna come to you. To, to, you know, you mess with them, you get up on a soapbox, out in, you know, the Malacón and you start talking about, you know, how we need, you know, uh, political parties and free elections, you'll have a, you know, a very quick trip to a place called Via Marista and that will be the end of your, your public speaking. Um, but if you don't do that, you can coexist very nicely, um, or possibly, or, uh, or not so nicely, but, but you're not going to get in trouble. Yeah? Well, the curious thing about Cubans, I mean, I have a lot of feelings about, you know, it's kind of, one of the things about Castro that I think, right, all right, there's a wonderful expression in Cuba, uh, Somos los Odias del Caribe, we are the Jews of the Caribbean. And they say this very proudly, you go, what? And uh, why would you want to be Jews? I mean, Jews have so many problems. Why are you telling everybody this? And, um, and to them, what that means is the Jews are uh, the smart, they're sharp, they're the chosen people, that's what they actually think this stuff, and they, 
and that they are they're entrepreneurial and they're smart. And um, and uh, well, the sad truth is, is they really are the Jews of the Caribbean, and they have the same problems as Jews. They are a pariah country uh, to some extent, and uh, they are n Cubans are not popular in the Caribbean because they are very entrepreneurial and very smart. You know, when Castro took over. Um, and a lot of people fled. A lot of people, let's say, went over to Puerto Rico. Well, I don't want to tell you how quickly it took to, for the Cubans to take, you know, to, you know, take, you know, get power and money and, and Puerto Rico. They do incredibly well everywhere. I mean, look what they've done in Miami. Well, no matter what you want to say, I mean, it's a very, you know, vibrant community. Um, and. Um, so there's, and the other thing is a lot of people say, oh my God, Castro, he talks so much, because my husband says they all talk so much. I mean, I remember we were down there on an early trip and we went to Alamar, which is one of these horrible housing projects that the Russians built, it's like 200,000 people on a block, and uh, you know, one of these horrors, and, and there's one of these little Fidel rallies, and I saw my husband and there was this little, you know, four-year-old girl and she was, just the way Cubans talk, and she was talking to him like this, you know, and she was just like, him. and the way they talk, like her hand going like this, and the, this, and I said, my God, it's just like, the, it's a country, little, you know, fidelitos, you know? But it isn't, it's the Cuban character. Cubans, I just read a hilarious essay um, in one of these books that I'm, you know, putting together for this anthology where, you know, and of course it's only a Cuban could say this, and he says, he says, you know, Cubans don't listen, they talk, and everybody talks at the same time. And, and if ever there's something that epitomizes what's going on in Cuba, I mean, what is going on in Miami and Havana except people talking at the same time? Literally, they have their own radio stations blasting each other, they cut off each other's circuit, if you're part of something called the dialogo, a dialogue, you, could, you, might, you, might, you might have your house blown up. I mean, it's unbelievable. The idea of a conversation is almost a criminal act. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is very exaggerated, but I'm trying to give you some sense of, I have my own theory, and this is incredibly politically incorrect, just like what I just told you about that, that motto, but it's true, and I'll say it anyway is that I have my theories about Cuba. When the conquistadores came to Cuba, you know, they landed in Baracoa. Columbus came to, first landed in Baracoa, which is just this heaven on earth on the western end of Cuba near Santiago. Um, he, um, um, you know, he said it was the most beautiful island, island in the world. And, um, and then soon after that, the Spanish massacred just about every Indian on this island. Um, there was a famous Indian chief called Atue. And I think it was the largest massacre of Indians anywhere in the New World. I mean, it's, you know, if you know anything about Mexico, it's a, you know, it's a very much a mestizo or mezcla population. And most of Latin America is, there's a heavy in. Cuba, they, I mean, decimated it. There's literally one of the largest cities in Cuba is called Matanzas, and it means massacres. Can you imagine calling it, you know, one of your biggest cities? They, uh, they, you know, they immolated them. Literally, they burned them at the stake. It was um, so. Again, this is very unscientific, and we whatever. But it strikes me that as being the only place in all of Latin America that has no Indian, you know, and so the whole country is uh, it's Afro. Cuban, so you're either Spanish, or you know, and the only other influence is a slave influence. So you have that. That's where you get the Afro-Cuban culture. But it always seemed to me that maybe some of the Indian qualities of the other countries were somewhat of a little kind of a Pacific nature, or a little calming. <laughs> but uh, there is no Indian blood in Cubans, and um, and I that's you know my own private anthropology is probably very specious, um, but it makes it works for me. Uh, you and most speakers on Cuba, like yourself, make a great reference to the Miami contingent. And, mm -hmm. and yet, in Cuba, 75% of the people are black. Mm -hmm. They're not gray, or they're, they're, they're not at all European, they're black. Mm -hmm. They're as black as the blacks in South 
in Alabama. And under Batista, they uh, fared worse than the blacks in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things, Castro let the blacks right. walk on the beach, let the blacks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but every time I hear something about Cuba, it only involves this probably 5% of the people, Cuban people, that are from Miami that were, mm -hmm. that had ties to, to Batista. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess the other 95% of the iceberg just doesn't seem to ever get exposed. Well, you want me to respond yeah. to that? Okay. Uh, you made a good general point, but let me just correct some of your statistics. When Fidel Castro took power, when Batista left in 59, the island was roughly 65% to 70% white at the time that Fidel Castro took power. Uh, it is now roughly exactly the opposite of that today, where you have 65 to 70% of the country black. Now, when I say black, um, and in Cuba this does mean something, people don't just say black. It means a, usually a mezcla, a mixture of colors and mulattoes, et cetera. Um, so, and even very white people in Cuba, they, there's an expression in Cuba, there's no white people, but even if you can't see it, there's black blood, um, except with the Spanish, Spanish like Fidel Castro. And that, anyway, uh, so you're absolutely right that uh, there was a huge race issue and a big, huge race card that never gets talked about and never gets addressed. Um, what happened was this, is that the, originally the ruling elite fled, the Batistianos, which were, who were entirely white. That's correct. Um, they left, and that's how we have this reverse in this demographic. And you're absolutely right that in the Miami um, XL community, it is mostly white. I remember looking at the membership of the Cuban American National Foundation which purports to, you know, they had the Blue Ribbon Commission to tell us what the next Cuba, there wasn't one black person, not one black person in this whole thing, in a country that is minimally 65% of mixed blood origin. However, um, that being said, I would say single hand, uh, without doubt that race is the single number one achievement of Fidel Castro. Now, is it because he's a great benevolent person? Is it because he comes from whatever? I don't really think so. He's a very shrewd guy. He sees these demographics. He endlessly plays on this. He talks endlessly about the racist, the racist, the racist Miami exile mafia. And, um, and Cuban racism is horrible. And it's very deep and very profound. Is there racism in Cuba today? You bet. I remember driving around just two years ago, and when things got bad during what's called the special period, and again, looking for scapegoats, it was again. I remember my friend, a very big intellectual, you would never think, saying to me, well, you know what we say here. And he said this in Spanish, but he said, he said, he said, um, he said, he said not, not all blacks, of course, are thieves, but all thieves are blacks. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and I could not believe this. Um, so you have this level, and his sister and brother-in-law are like big honchos in the ruling Communist Party. The early guerrillas, uh, Castro had a, a big, uh, a very prominent guerrilla named Juan, Juan Almeida, who was, who was black, who is black, <laughs> never changed. And, um, and also the man who saved his life, Pelletier, is also black. But you know, when Pelletier became a dissident, he didn't hesitate to put him in prison either. So there's plenty of blacks in prison. On the other hand, Cuba is tar really looks colorblind, and blacks and whites live together, they intermarry, they go to schools together. That, all that footage you saw of Elian Gonzalez, half his class is black, there's no question. His best friend is black. Um, but when they come to Miami, and they do come, blacks do come to Miami, as Balsados, also seeking you know, a better life or more money or whatever they want, a new house. Uh, what happens is when they get into Miami, they are segregated again. And, uh, and it is really something that, uh, there was a wonderful piece in the New York Times Magazine about that. Uh, not the magazine, I think it was in the, in their, their series on race in America. And 
uh, about this, these two friends, best friends in Havana, who lived together, I think it was Havana, came to Miami, never see each other, because the white guy lives in Miami Beach, the black guy lives in the black area. You know, he lives in the ghetto, because he can't live in, you know, and he talked about his experiences. Yes? I, uh, I live in Santa Barbara, and you're our guest here, and I like to be as, uh, as kind as I can. Mm -hmm. But it is really sad to hear your, your talk, because mm -hmm. I think that uh, mm -hmm. most of what you have said mm -hmm. is really twisting the truth. And we can go back to a number of points if you like. Mm -hmm. okay. Why don't you say something that bothers you? Well, for example, Can you, you refer to one thing? Yes. I think the only thing that was factual that you said was the composition of the blacks and whites before and afterwards. Uh, you talked about, for example, you. Wait, wait you're saying that the, you disagree with the statistics? No, I race. think your statistic is correct. I said right. that was the only factual thing I have heard you say in the whole. Mm -hmm. So the are, whole you talk. think there still is racism in Cuba or there is no racism in Cuba? Well, let me tell you this. Before, and there's one thing that you haven't done, mm -hmm. okay? So rather than and go over, no. over the things that you have said mm -hmm. that I, I, it's really bothersome and sad mm -hmm. how you have, I think, twisted some of the issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that is in, in a romantic sense. But the, uh, you haven't compared Cuba before Castro mm -hmm. to Cuba after Castro, mm -hmm. OK? And you haven't talked about what it is to be in Cuba today, mm -hmm. OK? And what has happened to Cuba that was an extremely prosperous country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just to, to mention one thing, for example, you didn't mention when you talked about the race right now, you didn't mention that Batista was a mulatto. That's right. Okay. Well, I, I, sir, sir, I can't say everything I know. No, I have but to, the point know. is the things that you, you talked about, uh, and I, if there's one thing that I wouldn't do is defend Batista because there's no defense, but the point is that, that the kind of life that existed in Cuba before, okay, mm -hmm. And Castro, for example, you said that he was put in jail in 55 when you went through the romantic situation with the Diaz Palar and so on. Castro and his people, they murdered mercilessly a number of people when they attacked that uh, Moncada. The Moncada in Santiago, mm -hmm. all right? They were put in jail for murders. And, and actually, Batista was a fairly astute guy. And he made a mistake in releasing these people. But uh, you know, you talk about Bernardo Benes and your conversation with him. He's a personal friend, mm -hmm. and I think that you should have another conversation with him. Okay, you talked about mm -hmm. uh, the mass family. Okay, mm -hmm. and the ma you mentioned and you referred to the so-called Cuban exiles. Most of these are American citizens now, mm -hmm. and, and you referred to mass as, as a scourge. I think was a word that you used. Uh, mass. Was I said he was Fidel Castro's scourge. Yeah. Mass Do you disagree is, with is that? A, yes. Mass is a man that came here as a laborer, okay, as an immigrant Well, laborer. a scourge just means a nemesis, and I think that he was very proud of being the scourge of Fidel Castro. Okay. Then I misinterpreted the meaning of the word right. in that respect. I agree with that. Right. Okay. Uh, but you did say something that is right. The Cuban community has been a very successful economical community. The community has contributed a lot to this country. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as, as uh, these people being under a cacique or type of, of complete political control. We're living in a, in, a, in a free country in the United States. Uh, so I think that that's misleading. But I, the most important thing is I haven't heard you talk about how terrible life is in Cuba today. The fact that today, not before, by the way, blacks in Cuba before were less discriminated that they were in those days in the United States, okay? Uh, you haven't talked about the fact that today a Cuban cannot go to a beach that is reserved for tourists. Mm -hmm. you, can, you didn't talk today about the fact that... that Sir, never... I, I, you know, we got to do one thing at a we're just We got to do one thing at a time. But I, let me make a few comments to what you just said already, because I can't keep up with it all. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Batista was part uh, Chinese. He was a Chino Cubano. He was part black. And he was, you know, he's a mixture. Um, however, and I think the gentleman probably knows the story, that because he was part black and even though he ruled the country, he could not go into the Havana Yacht Club. One of my best friends was in the Havana Yacht Club, uh, and when he entered 
He tried once to enter it, and she said they dimmed the lights to let him know that he was not welcome. Now, of course, you're talking about historical perspective about racism. Of course, there was racism in the 50s in this country, too, and there's racism everywhere. Uh, I mean, we got to, you know, we got to, is there, as I said, there is racism in Cuba today. A lot of people think it's, you know, absolutely paradise. I have tried to balance, you know, the people do not change in, entirely. And that character is character, but I can't go into every single issue. Now, on Mankata, uh, I think historians disagree with you on that. Um, I'm not saying I think Mankata was a good thing. I think it was another one of Fidel Castro's harebrained ideas. And, and uh, he was probably saved because he was married to the Diaz Ballards, because I have a friend who is uh, part of that family. And the Diaz, according to her, she says they paid the guards. I, if those of you who don't know, Several, many of the men that were with him um, were brutally, brutally murdered, um, eyes gouged out and worse. Uh, Ide Santa Maria, Abel Santa Maria, another guy, Colomé, horrendous. And um, uh, Castro and his brother emerged unscathed. There was an archbishop who did go to bat for them. But probably it was his marriage to Mirta Diaz Balart that saved the day for him in many respects, and with including the amnesty. Um, I, you know, anyway, I, I, I think most historians believe that what happened to the guerrillas when they stormed Mancada was in no way deserving of how these men were brutally tortured and murdered. Um, so I, I disagree with you on that, and I'm trying to think of another you think, I guess you think I'm demonizing Miami excess. No, I'm not. I, this is what I think is the problem, and I'll tell it to you in a nutshell. Is, let's just say you talk about Jews in Israel. It's just as a parallel conversation. Um, now, in the American Jewish community, you have people who are hawks. You have people who are doves. You have people who want to negotiate with the Palestinians. You have people who don't. And this is the opinion, by the way, of Jorge Dominguez, you know, who is the Cuban scholar at Harvard, who I have a, a very good regard for. What he says is the Cuban, exile, uh, uh, the Cuban exile community is dominated by just this one group. If you're not pro-embargo, if you're, if, if you're not for the theory of basically we will strangle them into submission, you, have, you, can't, you don't have any, uh, you have no, you no clout. No one will listen to you. You were, in other words, the diversity of opinion, like say you have on Israel, you're a hawk, you're a dove. You know what happened during the Oligo. You know what happened to all those people. I mean, there's, people still tell me that they're harassed as a result of that. And I'm not even talking about Magda, Montiel Davis, and what she did, okay? But I'm just talking about the first group in the 70s, not the one in the 90s. And these people are terribly harassed. I, I can give you, you know, there is a, there's another individual by the name of Jaime Sochliki, who, who I would give us more status as Dominguez, he thinks differently. But here's the thing. Yeah. The main thing that I think you, is what you have not said. You okay. have not said that About living in Cuba today is hell, okay? Regardless of, of what you as a tourist might see when you go there. Well, yeah. I don't go as a tourist, I do go as a reporter. And I'll tell you if you, if you, is your question now, because no one has asked me to describe my impressions of Cuba today. Would you like me to do that? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Um, my own personal nature, my personal, the qualities of my life and who I am, I just am just not a good communist. It would never have worked for me. And in my particular situation, uh, and I'm not saying through any virtue of my, my character, I would have probably been on the first boat out. Um, um, now, that said, I think this is very, very complex. Um, most Cubans, I think, supported the revolution against Batista. I have a very good friend who says, if you didn't have Batista, you couldn't have had Castro. And I think that's true. If you didn't have that level of, um, you know, the terrible things that went on during Batista, I don't think you would have had such a reaction to him. Um, Cuba today, all right. I think it's, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a suffering country. It's a suffering third world country. Do I think it's as bad 
Do I think it's the worst of the work? No, I do not. Do I think there's worse places in Latin America? Yes. Do I think the 40 miles away in Haiti, things are a lot worse? People come every day from Haiti and things are worse. And even in Santo Domingo, last time I was down there, I was at some restaurant and who do you think was, uh, there was all these workers there from the, the, the DR, the Dominican Republic, coming to Cuba. Can you imagine going to Cuba to look for jobs? Um, in, in the tourism area. Um, there's things that are very, very deeply disturbing to me. Um, the lack of free speech. I mean, I think that what the gentleman says, he does bring up something that's important, and that is it's very important not to romanticize Fidel Castro. Um, he is a dictator. And what happens is that we see crazy things, or what most people perceive as crazy things, such as the Elian Gonzalez of keeping this boy from this, this, fan, this man who's obviously an okay father. And, and that we, what, what happens is, is there's a knee-jerk reaction to demonize the exiles and it makes cash. You know, actually Jorge Dominguez said something very interesting about this. And he said, with enemies, with, with Fidel Castro's enemies in Miami, he doesn't need any friends. And there's a little bit of the same thing with the Palestinian situation. Remember they used to say the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Um, my political theory is entirely summed up with this. My theory, my thing is, is we have tried one thing for 42 years. The only thing that critics and supporters believe and can agree on. There's only one thing that everybody agrees on with Cuba. Complete failure. Our stated goals have not been achieved. We have not toppled Fidel Castro. We have not brought, brought democracy to Cuba, right? All I suggest is this, try something else. Now there's another thing I think that's very, very important to mention is there is an embargo that's in place because of this faction in Miami that wants it there. And they believe, they, they believe this and they want that. However, who breaks the embargo every day? Cuban exiles break the embargo. An estimated $1 billion are, is sent to Cuba every single year. $1 billion. That just about keeps the whole country in business. Uh, and that's not to mention the frequent flyer. Every time I fly to Havana, who's on the plane? There might be one other reporter. It's Cuban exiles, and they are on those planes. They, they call them gusanos, the bags they carry, these huge bags. And they, I've seen women on these planes with television sets, with blenders, with these Panama hats. I mean, they have toasters on their heads. They are, go into that country, and every day you have planes going into Havana from this country alone. And, and just on frequent flyer miles, and not to mention all the other. So my other thing is the point of hypocrisy. If Cuban exiles don't want the rest of us to live under an embargo and we can't you know, buy things and money, why are they sending a billion dollars and why are they going back? You keep referring to Cuban exiles. Well, it really is Cuban American. Most of those people are American citizens. Exactly. But remember, they asked to be called in exiles. They do not get asked to be called immigrants. And you're right, there's Cuban Americans, and many are citizens, and many are just Americans here. But remember, the terminology exile comes from the community that says we are not immigrants. It depends who you talk to. Exactly. That's a small group. It is not a monolith, and I now, think that's very important. Now, here's the thing. You just compare Cuba today with Haiti and the Dominican Republic, okay? Mm -hmm. And just by doing that, I think you are, just by doing that, you're favoring and, and speaking of the current government in a good light. Because what you have to compare Cuba is to what was Cuba right. before Castro. If you're going to do a good, good comparison point. of the results of the so-called revolution. Okay, okay, good point. I think there was a middle class in Cuba, that's true. And by the way, Havana, for those of you who haven't seen it, was one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Magnificent. They are starting some restoration. La Habana Vieja, the old city, is being built up. It was a gorgeous, um, a gorgeous city. It's in shambles. It's the first time I went there, I was in shock. You see these buildings just crumbling. I mean, you can walk down the Malacone, and as you're walking by, and you better be careful because the whole building can collapse right on you. 
Uh, a lot of people sort of, like, they think it looks like Venice and this pentimiento uh, effect that it has. But I mean, obviously, if you live there, it's heartbreaking. Um, you, know, you know, the big issues are freedom of, freedom of press, dissent. Um, like I said, you get up on a soapbox, you're going to be in trouble. There are four, well, there's, uh, there's, there's around probably, there's at least three interpolitical prisoners, people who are in prison just for saying things like they want to start a political party, independence, etc. Like I said, if you don't mess with the government and you don't make statements and you don't, you know, what in their eyes make trouble, they don't come after you. Um, it's not like death squads in the street. Um, but you do not, I have a very good friend there who never left and she's, um, <laughs> she's actually a direct descendant of Simone Bolivar on both sides of her family. And she was from the, one of the wealthiest families in Cuba. And she stayed on, became a revolutionary, and now she's quite a dissident. Um, she was at one time the head of the Museo Nacional. She says, she, her big line is this, she said, you, we used to have the rich and we used to have the poor, now we're all poor. Uh, but there was a middle class. Now, there's a, the other uh, big claim that, um, you know, that Fidel Castro does make is the literacy, and I think that is legitimate. They do have the highest rate of literacy now in the Americas, not just in Latin America or South America. Now, but the next thing you might want to say, in the first story I ever wrote about Cuba, I said here, it's just ironies abound. Yes, they have the highest literacy, in the, it, higher than the American literacy at this point, but they have no paper, they have no pens, they have nothing to read. So, what, so that, I think, is more to the point, you know, is what are these things if you don't have, you know, if you don't have books to read? And you also made the comment about uh, racism. There is a thing now, a, a process that a lot of the critics call tourism apartheid. And it is very, very disturbing. And when I'm in Cuba, I have many, many Cuban friends. And um, for me to bring them into a hotel, I have to invariably make a big scene. Uh, I have a friend who is a scientist there. These are people who stayed behind, supported the revolution, have stuck there through thick and thin. But she said to me on this last trip, she says, this is the thing that breaks me. She says, this is, she went out to Varadero, which is where the, the tour, you know, where all the hotels are and beautiful beaches, soon to look like Miami Beach, the way they're building it up at this point. And she told me she wanted to go to the beach where she grew up as a child. And she went to the beach, and the girl comes out, she says, oh no, this is an all-inclusive hotel, you can't come in. That means you, you, you know, uh, tourists, they buy everything, their meals, etc. And she said, what do you mean I can't come in? I just want to see the beach where I grew up. And they said, no, you can't come in, this is all-inclusive. And she says, I'm a Cuban, I'm a Cuban, how could you, I grew up here, how could you not let me on this beach? And she said that, you know, she was dealing with this dingy girl, you know, clerk, and she said she went, and this breaks, I just put it in a story I wrote, she went into the middle of the lobby and she recited a poem called Tango by Nicholas Guillen, who oddly enough was a Cuban black poet, revolutionary, supported the Castro, and he wrote a poem called Tango, I have. And he wrote this poem about, and this was during the Batista years, about how, you know, basically one day Cuba, the sea, he talks about the democratic sea and the open sea and the beaches for everybody and how could there only be beaches for certain people and how everything belonged to all the Cubans. And she stood there, and this is an old fidelista, and she said she stood in the lobby and she recited this at the top of her lungs this very famous Cuban poem of Guillen's, if you live in, you know, if you're, you know, it's in all the schools. To, and, and I said, well, what happened, Sonia? She said, oh, the woman was an idiot. She said she had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the irony, and it's a heartbreaking ir irony. And you say, how much longer can people like that, you know, what a bitter pill. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Those who are sympathetic to the Cuban Revolution have often argued that one of their great accomplishments has been the health care system. If I'm not mistaken, Fidel has even offered to help solve our medical mess here mm -hmm. uh, within the last year. <laughs> God help us um, all. <laughs> on the other hand, I'm acquainted with several gay Cubans 
who claim that the treatment of gay and lesbians uh, has been brutalizing uh, since the communists took over there. Would you address these two issues, the health care system and the treatment of gay and lesbians? Again, you know, everything is complex. You know, nothing is simple. Um, and there are no monoliths. And one thing that I think is really, really important, and one of the things that most bothers me about the term exiles is the idea of a monolith, that everybody's the same. As far as I'm concerned, Cubans are as diverse, the Cuban-American community as diverse as any other community. Um, however, I think the tragedy is, is, that, is that there's only one group that speaks for policy, and that to me is, but, you know, I mean, I have, you know, just dozens, I'm going to Miami this week, and I'll see all my Cuban friends there, and basically there's a kind of a generational divide, is, you know, the children, I would say under 40, let's move this along, let's try to open this up, we want more person-to-person -person contacts, let's try to move this along without bloodshed, and their parents, and a lot of my friends, they sneak back and forth to Cuba and they don't tell one of the parents who, you know, would be very upset with them. Uh, but more and more you're seeing, I I've just noticed on the planes going to Cuba, how many more older people I see there are going back and forth. But I think it's very, very important not to do the idea of a monolith, you know, that there's one cookie cutter size and um, type person. Um, on the health care, yeah, Fidel Castro's got this thing about doctors, and um, he's always been, you know, a lot of the people around him are doctors. I mean, and from the early days of the revolution, his big, uh, you know, compañera was a woman named Celia, uh, uh, Celia Sanchez, and her father was a doctor. His best friend was a guy named Rene Vallejo, and he was a doctor. And today you have his finance minister is a pediatrician, and that may be what's wrong with their economics, uh, Carlos Laje. Um, he does have, you know, um, and when I interviewed him, you know, he has a very obsessional thing about science and doctors and medical stuff. The, what, again, it's one of the ironies. Yes, they have a lot of doctors. Try to get an aspirin. I was in some hotel a couple years ago, and I had a really uh, very famous pool, this old Miramar. Anyway, I slipped because it was in such bad condition, and I really tore my, uh, just really gashed open. I was just gushing blood. Well, there were three doctors in the hotel on duty, 24-hour duty, three doctors, no aspirin. And this is in a tourist area, no aspirin, no bandages. Do you know what they gave me? <laughs> they wrapped me up in sheets to stop the bleeding. Um, so you have real um, shortages of supplies. Now obviously if you go to what's called CMEC, which is the hospital of, you know, more VIPs and things like that, they even have tourist hospitals there. So it's kind of, and then also there's questions of the quality of training as well. Um, so there's issues that have been, but yes, they have probably more doctors per capita than anybody at this point, but tremendous shortages on um, supply. On the other hand, you know, with this whole Lillian Gonzalez thing, I was, last time I was in Cardenas, which is where they're all from, and I was talking to one of the uncles of Elian, who in fact his entire family died on that boat. You may have read a story of mine in George magazine. I wrote a story about the 10 people who, ele I'm sorry, 11 people who died on that boat that Elian Gonzalez survived on. 11 people died. All this country ever talked about is this little boy, but all his mother and two entire families drowned. And I was talking to um, this man uh, who was his uncle and who lost five members of his family. And I went back to see him uh, two months ago because the last time I saw him, he was in such a devastated state. Anyway, one of the things he said to me, um, now this is interesting, he was invited to go on the boat. His brother, you know, invited him on the boat and he didn't go. So you have to say, why doesn't this man go? His other three brothers had also left at different times in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He doesn't want to go. You have this split. And not because he's a big political. He's just the idea of exile, separation. He's also a guy, <laughs> you know, he's been in this kind of cradle-to-grave situation because basically you're not going to starve to death in Cuba. I just was, on my last trip, we drove through every single province. I wanted to really be in the provinces. And we went to Camagüey, Olguin, 
Baracoa. I mean, literally every province on the island, because of course, you know, talking about Cuba and only going to Havana is like talking about America and only going to New York City. It's absolutely nothing. And the two uh, things, but in any event, what he was telling me is, is that what he was saying to me, he says, you know, on my knee, this, he's a petroleum worker, he works in the oil fields. He says, you know, I'm gonna have this surgery on my knee. And I said, oh yeah, what are you gonna, he says, getting laser surgery on his knee. And um, he says, what is that gonna cost you in the United States, laser surgery on your knee? And he was so proud of this. And he says, I bet you $20,000, you know. So, you know, one day he can't get aspirin at the corner, the next day he's getting laser surgery. So it's a complex, it's very complex and very crazy. On the gay lesbian issue, there was a horrendous crackdown called UMOP. That's everything in Cuba's got initials. I have no idea what's with them. But it's he, the everything, MININT, MINFAR, everything has got these initials, these, these kind of communist style acronyms. And UMOP was basically the Nuevo Hombre, the new man. And that was a horrendous thing that I think was basically from 64 to 69. And it wasn't just gays, it was dissidents, you know. Um, and some of the big Cuban figures were rounded up during that period, and I did write about this. And um, I interviewed a guy named Alfredo Guevara, who's a lot of people regard as Castro's best friend, and, in, and um, who's gay. Of course, you can't say that in Cuba. And they, and I, I, anyway, anyway, he told me that he went in and he pleaded with him about it. He and. Vilma Espin and Celia Sanchez, and that they were able to somehow to put the brakes on it. But basically, they, they were interned. They were interned, and a f great filmmaker named Nestor Almendros wrote, uh, made a wonderful movie with, um, I think it's Orlando Leal, uh, called Nobody's Listening, and which was about the internment. And it really was, you know, because the whole left in the United States, you know, had. I call Fidel Castro the movie star dictator. I mean, this is a guy, he's a dictator, but everybody, it's like, they, they talk about him, it's like Warren Beatty and all the reporters. And I think part of it has to do with all the reporters are always gonna, going down to Havana and everybody's waiting around for Fidel. And he keeps them waiting. I've seen this with Ted Koppel, Tom Brokaw, Peter John. They wait around in their hotel rooms, they pace like animals, and by the time they get to see him, they're so desperate, they're groveling. And, um, and he, you know, it's the same thing. And I was reading last night a book, a very, very critical book of Cuba by Jacoba Timmerman. You may recall the great Argentine writer who was locked up in the dirty war in Argentina and wrote a book called Prisoner Without Name, Cell, uh, or a cell whatever, Cell Without Number, Prisoner Without Name. And he wrote about this thing and how they eventually were trying to, they were offering him the Castro interview and he didn't want it. <laughs> he wanted to do what I did, which is go through the provinces. But um, basically, um, it's true that the American left was very, very disarmed by Castro. There was a tremendous seduction. And I think there's very complicated reasons for that. Um, you know. Historically, you have to understand that Cuba was dominated by the Spanish. Actually, there, this is an interesting, funny joke right now. The Spanish now are investing so much money in Cuba today that the joke in Cuba, they call it La Reconquista. You know, they've reconquered them. And they are buying up so much stuff. Or in, and then you have the Italians. I mean, all these countries basically have parts of Cuba, Cayo Largo. You know, it's all Italians, there's places you see, you know, the hotels, they sort of have their little, you know, areas. Um, but am I going off, I think I'm going off um, your topic, you wanted to know about gays and health care. Um, I asked him, I'll, I'll give you a funny story about Castro and gay stuff. Um, I, did a, I did as much homework as I could on my first trip when I did my interview with Castro. And I asked him, um, about what you said. I said, how come you locked up all the gays and lesbians and, um, and uh, you know, not les by the way, not lesbians. As far as I know, no women. I don't think that Cuban culture can admit that Cuban women would not be interested in a Cuban man. I think the whole concept does not exist. I mean, I mean, and as far as I know, Cuban lesbians, and there were a lot of them involved with the original guerrillas, actually. 
But Cuban men, is, that's a whole other thing. And that's a very complex area, and I have actually written a little bit about that. But um, is, I asked him, I said, how in God's name could you do this? <laughs> and uh, he first immediately denied it, and he said, no, we've never done anything like that. And he, and he, da -da 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 -da. And then he said, I personally have never had a bad feeling about gays. And he said, some of my best friends are gay, basically. And he pointed to this mural behind him, which is a mural by Puerto Carrero, great, great Cuban artist, beautiful mural. And he said, see, he was a friend, you know? <laughs> of course, he's dead. Uh, and, um, and I said, yes. And I said immediately, and I said, and of course, yes. And Alfredo Guevara is your best friend, uh, who's gay. Obviously, everybody in Cuba knows this. He went, oh, no, oh, no, not my best friend. And basically, if you read my interview with Fidel Castro, he gets so upset about this, and he, and he says to me, he says, no, Alfredo Guevara was a hero of the revolution. And I go, I understand that, um, but he was also gay. He says, no, he's a hero of the revolution. I go, I said, yes, yes, he's just gay. It's okay. It's no big deal. I said, in the United States, it's not a big deal. No one cares. He says, nope. He's not get, he's a hero of the revolution. I said he could be both. Well, the next day I get a visit from one of his aides to tell me Fidel Castro can't sleep thinking about this, that I would think that Alfredo Guevara is gay. <laughs> well, of course, I put the whole thing in my story. But I mean, that just tells you. Now, I'm going to say something else that's going to probably make my friend here uh, really mad at me. One of the things that I think has been so unfortunate about um, a portion of the Cuban-American community in Miami is many of the attacks when they don't like people have been incredibly homophobic. For instance, when Nelson Mandela wanted to come to the United States, uh, when he did come to the United States, because he had supported Cuba in some way, there was an incredible campaign against him. And what was virtually a mantra on Miami radio was they called him a marijuana maricon. That's what he was called, a pot-smoking, very impolite word for uh, gay. Someone else could, uh, th that's what he was called around the clock, a marijuana maricon. I have written stuff, and I have been called, you know, I've written, when I, well, okay, uh, sometimes I write things that I lose my visa and I can't go to Cuba. You know, for two and a half years, they didn't let me on the island after I wrote a piece about Robert Vesco in Cuba. Then I write a piece. And, and they love that piece in Miami, and they'll read that piece. Then I'll write a piece about Luis Posada, uh, which Fidel Castro loves, and he reads that one on the radio in, in Havana. And the next thing I hear on the radio on Miami, I'm a, una espia, I'm a spy, a traidor, I'm a, a, a lover of Fidel Castro, and I'm a tortillera, I'm a lesbian. I, I mean, I am all these things. Then, and, and a lot of the, the, one of the things that really bothers me in this, in this, and it's on both sides, in Cuba and in Miami, is the amount of name calling that is so, just the amount of name calling, and so much of it is homophobic. Um, and you'll probably disagree with me about it, but I think it in some ways it's that intolerance. I was reading, again, an essay this man who talked about talking in Cuba, and he was saying that the intolerance was the span, you know, the pure Spanish blood, you know, that he, you know, who knows? My, I, I, by the way, my, I have to take it on to myself. My father's family are from the very same area that Fidel Castro's family's from, <laughs> Gallegos. So um, I, I obviously have some of it too. 